Heavenly Father, Holy God in heaven, we are utterly dependent upon you for life, for salvation, for redemption, and for hope. Father, you have heard our worship in this place today. We praise you for who you are, but we praise you also for who you are and what you have done for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us through the word, through your son, Christ, and that by him we have hope, hope to be redeemed, hope that someday we will be with you for all of eternity. So, Father, as we now engage with your word, will you please once again remind us of the hope that is found only in your son. May your Holy Spirit speak boldly to us, piercing us where we must be pierced, God, transforming us where we must be transformed, convicted, and even comforted. God, meet with us as we meet with your word now, we pray. In the name of your Son, the one true vine, we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you for engaging in that. How wonderful it is to have the word of God spoken by the people of God. Somebody said to me last service, how about we just do that instead of your sermon next week? I'm like, <laughs> sounds good, sounds good. I'm not sure how to take that, but sounds good, sounds good. We're really glad that you're here. We want to invite the ushers to come forward at this time. We take an offering here in our service. You can also give online. And you can give through text message to what God's doing here at Grace Chapel. But we give, and we do so as an act of worship. The Bible says don't give under compulsion, don't give reluctantly, but to give cheerfully. So Grace Chapel, it is now time to take our offering. So we cheerfully give. Ushers, you may pass the plates. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving. It's amazing to see what's happening here at our church. We're, we're continually having financial health and growth, which is great. We're able to bless people locally and globally. So thank you for your faithfulness to give to the mission here. I'm so excited about what God's doing in our midst. And I believe that we are on the brink of what are our greatest days yet ahead of us. If you're visiting, we're super glad that you're here. And thank you for joining us for worship today. If you don't have a church home, then we want to extend an invitation to you. You're welcome to make this your church home. We'd love to connect with you. The main way that we do that is through the connect card that was given to you in the bulletin as you walked in today. There's a place for us to get some information about you, but also for you to check some boxes and tell us what information about us you would like to receive. So if you'll fill that out, you can drop by uh, the info desk down here in the lower lobby or in the upper lobby. Let them know that you're visiting. They have a gift for you. And we would love to uh, exchange a warm handshake and welcome you here in our midst. And as always, my friends, that Connect card is a place for you to put your prayer requests. We probably get between 60 and 100 prayer requests. Is that true, Linda? Every week? I mean, we get a lot of prayer requests, and it's one of my joys as a pastor to be able to read that, not just what you're requesting, but also your praises. So I think everyone, everyone could probably fill one of those out, and I'd love for you to take a moment, fill out, let us know what's going on in your life, and you can drop those in the boxes as you leave today. And we will be faithful to pray for you, I promise. I want to start today by reflecting on maybe those moments that you've had of frustration with someone else, or maybe it's frustration you've even had with yourself. That moment where you knew you had one job and you messed it up. Has anybody ever been there before? And you've had someone maybe who you gave one job, man, one job, and they messed it up. Well, I was laughing about that this week, and I decided I would look for people who had one job and messed it up. I found a few images I have to share with you. One of them rang true in my life. That was this one. This guy had a home project, and he had <laughs> one job, man, one job to get the doorknob right, right? One job. And if you've ever been there before you, you, and had this happen to you, you know how frustrating it is when you do a project and you get to the end and you're like, I had one job, and I messed it up, right? I have to redo the whole thing. One job, man. Let's just say that all together. You had one job, man. You had one job. Ready? You had one job. This guy had one job. So did this guy. He had to put the stickers on the door at Target. He had one job. Put the stickers on the right doors. Now, I'm thinking he's like, why spread out across the doors? Let's just do it all on one door, right? He had one job. Let's say that together. You had one job, man. Or how about this guy? This guy, he hung this sign. <laughs> and just follow the irony of this. This one made me crack up, right? He had one job. One job. Get the sign right on the outside of the building. 
And, and he messed up. I don't know if you can see it, but the C is over here on the brick wall, okay? It's the ollage of architecture and planning. The funny part is, I think he started with the word planning, exactly. right? How ironic. Plan, man. You had one job. Let's say it together. You had one job. Or how about this guy that works at Taco Bell? His one job. Get the ingredients in the taco shell. <laughs> I don't know if you see this, but all the ingredients are outside of the taco shell. I mean, he missed it by like a 16th of an inch, right? To that, we would all say, you have one job, right? Or finally, this guy. <laughs> just, just for a moment, imagine how the conversation went with this guy and his supervisor, okay? Just get your mind around that. He's looking at it, and he goes, so, so top. Satup, Satup. You had one job, right? And not only that, the stop sign was already there to help you, man. Like a kindergartner could have done it better than you. And to that we would say, you have one job, one job, right? When it comes to our Christian faith, I think we have one main job. We have one thing that we are called to do and that is to glorify our God in heaven. So often, we think about Christianity or walking with Christ as a lot of little jobs, a lot of commands to obey, a lot of things to do, and if you've journeyed with Christ for any amount of time or been in the church for any amount of time, you realize that there are a lot of things he tells us to do or attitudes to have. But I would submit to you this morning that all of the commands of Christ come back to our one job, to glorify God. We have one job. If you were to ask Molly and I, what are the rules of your house? Molly mentioned this on, on Mother's Day. We have two rules in our house. First, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can do anything in our house as long as you don't compromise those two commands. The second, like the first, all goes back to the idea of loving God supremely over all things, to glorify him in all areas of our life. We are called, yes, as Christians, to obey Christ and to follow Christ in all that he's told us. But all of that comes back to our one job, which is to glorify the Lord. Now, here's the truth. You and I will fail miserably if we try to glorify the Lord in our own efforts. In fact, I would submit to you the same thing I think Christ submits to us, that it is humanly impossible for us to please the Lord without the work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. But he calls us to do one thing, to glorify the Father. That's all Jesus Christ was about, and I believe that's all that we are to be about as well. But so often we start thinking, well, there's all the things I have to do, all the things I have to obey. And then we start coming up with a false theology of thinking we do these things in order to get something else that is outside of the great reward that Christ offers us, which is to know him and to be in a relationship with him. Follow me on this. I think our, our cultural narrative, the story told by our culture is that we obey for the sake of reward. And the main reward that our culture tells us we're working towards is greater comfort. You can see it in a Dove commercial. You can see it in a Lexus car ad. All of these things are constantly telling us work towards your greatest comfort. Find a way to reward yourself. And while certainly there are many things that God has given us, gifts and knowledge and skills that he's given us that do make life more convenient, more fashionable, more meaningful at times. Ultimately, we aren't living for greater comfort. We are living for the glory of God. Comfort is not the goal. God's glory is the goal. And if we live for our own comfort then we will leave out the goal of glorifying the Lord. If our prevailing mindset of living is so that I can be more comfortable, then I'm only gonna be individualized, I'm only gonna be more privatized in my life, I'm gonna look for what's enjoyable, what's productive, what's fashionable, I'll avoid what's difficult, what's slow, what's mundane, 
And I'll live for me. I'll live to please me. And if our goal is ever to please ourselves, then we will altogether miss the target of pleasing the Lord or bringing glory to him. Because living for ourselves is the breeding ground for an inordinate, self-focused life that does not love Christ or bring glory to him and does not ultimately love other people. When we look at the idea of abiding in the Lord, the idea of abiding in Christ, which we started looking at last week, is this beckoning to abandon self-service. It is a calling to strive for an eternal weight of glory. I shared with you last week, 2 Corinthians, we live for this eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. That is our reward. The ultimate glory of God and being with him in glory for all of eternity. In this life, we abide in Christ, striving to find our hope, our joy, our love, and our lasting reward by being with him now and ultimately forever. Our one job is not to serve ourselves but it is to glorify God. And we do this by remaining close to him. So we're gonna continue our series this morning entitled Abide. And if you're a Christian, I wanna say to you, I think this should be one of your favorite passages. I said that last week, but I, I absolutely believe verses one through 11 should be something that you are familiar with and that you love because this passage tells you how you get God, but also how God gets you and what it means to walk with him in intimacy every single day. Now, this is a wonderful passage because it does tell us how we are gotten by God, how he has us, and how we have life in him. But it's not just a passage that makes us feel good. It's a passage that also has great instruction with it, of which we're gonna see more of today than even we did last week. He gives us encouragement and instruction. It does feel good, but it's also clear. And I would even tell you that in the context of which he's speaking this to the disciple, these were fighting words. He's in his last few hours with his disciples, crossing from Mount Zion across the Kijan Valley to Gethsemane to go into prayer before the crucifixion story begins. And in this walk, after he's left the upper room, he's explaining them how beautiful it is to stay with him and obey him even past the time that he's here on earth. I've entitled my message today, The Joy of Staying and Obeying, because I believe that's what he's getting at. He's saying, remain faithful to me in the rough times and even in the good times. Remain faithful to me, obey me, and you will have me, and I will have you. Now listen, if you're looking for greater purpose in this place today, let's say you're just struggling with your identity, you're not sure what the purpose of your life is, this passage is going to offer you some very clear identity statements, things you can cling on to and say, this is who I am in Christ. And maybe you're sitting here today going, I I really want to know how to leave a meaningful legacy past my time here. I want to have great impact on the generations to come. I believe that this passage will show you the benefits that come from staying and obeying now and what you will pass on past your life here on earth. So if you have your Bibles, open it with me to John chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 8 through 11 today. It's found on page 902, kind of starts over on 901 and 902 in the Bibles that are in front of you. And I want you to grab one of those Bibles. I'd love everybody's eyes on this. And in a moment, we're going to stand and read these verses together. But I want you to look at these passages. Follow along with me on the Grace Chapel app if you'd like to. And I want us to be note-taking people. So please flip over your bulletin or take notes in the app. But I want to make sure that you write down some of the things that God speaks to you this morning. And then as always, if you have questions during my message, I want to encourage you to text them into the number that's on the screen, which is also located on the back of your bulletin. I read those every week. They influence my sermon. And if we have enough time, I'll take some of those questions live here today. But let's go ahead and stand to our feet and let's read John chapter 15. We're going to read verses 8 through 11 out loud. Again, starts a little bit over on 901 and then we'll flip over. It says... Ready? Verse 8. Here we go. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, 
and that your joy may be fulfilled. This is the reading of God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me summarize for you what verses one through seven say, just to jog your memory, because eight through 11 have much more meaning if we understand these in context. There were three roles that were mentioned in the first seven verses of John 15. The vine, the vine dresser, and the branches. Who's the vine? Jesus is the vine. So we talked about last week. Who's the vine dresser? The father. And who's the branches? Us, right. We are all in this picture, this beautiful illustration that he's giving to us. And he explains in these first three verses, not only, or excuse me, the first seven verses, not only the three roles that we must get our minds around, but what happens as we interact with one another. He paints this beautiful picture that we as the branches derive our life from the vine. He also paints a beautiful picture that the vine dresser is the one who comes in. He gets rid of branches that would claim to be part of the vine but are not. And he also prunes some branches that need to be pruned so that we may have greater fruitfulness. We talked a lot about pruning last week, that he comes in and he cuts some things back because he says, listen, I want you to bear even more fruit for my glory. And I was so moved by that fact uh, that that I shared with you last week, that that the hand of the Father is never closer than when he is pruning us. When he comes in and he says, listen, that's got to go. This has got to go. We got to move some things around so that you can have greater fruitfulness. In my further study of this idea of pruning, it's not only grabbing branches that we think might bear fruit, but then he cuts off so that they will bear more fruit, he, he also comes and lifts up the droopy branches. If you understand this idea of pruning that's happening in the original language, it can also mean to lift up what is sagging. I don't know about you, but there have been many branches in my life, in my Christian walk with the Lord, where he comes in and he says, this, this branch, it's, it's drooping. And he comes and he gently lifts it, and he lifts it, and he lifts it until finally the branch stands on its own and bears much fruit. He is a faithful father. That's what's happening here in this passage. Now, I want, I want to be clear. I got a text message last week from one of you that said, so are you saying that God makes us sick or gives us diseases in order to prune our character? And I want to highlight a word that I gave you last week just to, just to answer that text specifically. I believe the pruning of God is the allowed affliction in our life that makes us more dependent upon God. It's allowed affliction. We looked at several verses in Psalm 119. We could look at Job. We could look at things in Paul, even with the thorn that he continues to mention. On down the line, there are times where he allows affliction in our life so that he can strengthen our faith and our dependence upon him. And we also talked about last week how in these first few verses, we are called to believe and take him at his word, to pray in his name. It's the second time it's mentioned in this upper room discourse. He's saying, pray in my name, be within me, trust my instruction for daily living. So the calling is for us to abide, to stay close and connected to the vine. But then in verse 8, he says, bear much fruit. You can see it for yourself. This is so my father will be glorified, that you will bear much fruit. Prove to be my disciples. As the father loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in me. This emphasis here is this idea of bearing much fruit clearly in verse eight, but also mentioned for us in two, four, and five. Several times he's saying, prove that you're my disciples, disciples, and the proof will be in the fact that you're bearing fruit. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The goal of abiding, that's your first fill in the blank, the goal of abiding is that the Father is glorified through you bearing much fruit. Why do we abide? For the sake of connectedness, And as I talked about last week, the very lifeblood of the Holy Spirit is pumping through our veins. That's what makes us spiritually vibrant. But we go on to bear much fruit for the Father's glory. The goal of abiding, the one job of abiding is that we will glorify our Father in heaven by bearing fruit. 
Now, it's worth asking, what is this fruit that he's speaking of? What exactly is he getting at? Perhaps the easiest definition that we could go to is found in Galatians, the fruits of the Spirit. That passage that's all familiar to us that says the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against the, all such things, there is no law. This is the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit that he is in our life, that he is the lifeblood within our veins. So when he's telling us to bear much fruit, I believe he's calling us to things just like this. But I want to make a statement very clearly this morning. I think when he's saying bear much fruit in this passage, and it may be best represented by things such as this, he's first talking about inward qualities that will have an outward expression. If you read this in its context, he's trying to say there are inward graces that you will have by abiding in the vine. And as you stay connected to the vine, you will then bear fruit, which are these outward displays of inward transformation. You have love on the inside, joy on the inside, peace on the inside. Your inner self, your soul, the deepest part of you has been transformed and made new. And as you are made new by these inner graces, you will have outward fruit. Now, loved ones, I think, I think this should cause pause for all of us to examine our own life for a moment and to see if there are fruit-bearing qualities that are happening in our walk with Christ. Are we bearing much fruit? I think, sadly, too many people can profess Christ with their mouth, but their life does not show it. In a life that is truly transformed, yes, will confess the Lord with their lips, but their life will also tell the story that they are transformed, changed, that on the inside something's different and it's expressing itself on the outside. Now, if I were to say to you, examine your own life, see if there's fruit in your life. I'm gonna guess that most of us will go down a list of what we are doing for the Lord, right? Right? And I don't think this passage is about what you are doing. I don't think that's what it's talking about, and that's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is the idea of abiding, the inward transformation, the main source that would bear fruit comes from your connection to the vine. So when we examine our life and say, am I bearing fruit, what we're doing is we're saying, am I connected to the vine? You have to be connected to the vine in order to bear true. We all understand an apple doesn't come first and then the branch and then the trunk, right? The apple comes last. So also our life must be close, dependent, developing deep roots of righteousness in Christ. And when we abide in Christ, it will show up in our countenance and in our conduct. The way we carry ourselves and the things we do for others and for the Lord. It will show up in our countenance and in our conduct. I was thinking of a story that I could use to illustrate this, and the story I, I once heard came to mind. It's a story about five gold miners in California in the gold rush. These five gold miners found this vein of gold. They were very excited about it. They realized that this is going to make them filthy rich. So they made a, a pact with each other not to tell anyone else about this vein of gold that they found. They said, you promise you're not going to tell? You promise, you promise, you promise? They all promised. They said, I promise I won't tell anyone about what we've found. Just the five of them were going to work to dig this up and go off with their riches. Well, they end up leaving the place where they found the gold, and they go down into the city to put in their claim on this piece of land and then to buy their tools so that they can go back and do the digging. As they go into the town, they do all of their business. As they're walking out of the town, now a massive crowd of people is following them on their way out of town. They each look at each other. Who told? You told. No, you told. No, I didn't tell. And they're all like, we didn't tell. We promised we didn't tell. And as the story goes, the crowd of people were following the five gold miners because of the smiles on their faces. The people in the town knew they found something good because it's showing externally. So also, my friends, when we are abiding in the Lord, 
when our life is hidden in Christ, it will show outwardly in our countenance and in our conduct. I wrote this down for you in the bulletin. When our life is hidden in Christ, which I talked to you last week about, hidden in is the same idea of abiding in. It's the Old Testament phrase for it. When our life is hidden in Christ, it becomes a display of God's glory for the world. Maybe somebody said to you, I hope somebody has said this to you. They've said to you, you're just different. You're different. And hopefully you're like, yeah, I am different because I have Jesus Christ in my life and and he's changed me completely. Hopefully you aren't like, yeah, I am different. Because different for different sake isn't gonna make any difference. But different for Christ's sake will make all the difference in the world. We are called to be hidden in Christ, abiding in Christ. And as we are abiding in him, our life will be a display of God's glory for the whole world to see. I was looking at my Bible this week that I had while I was in college, and um, I found in the margin of this passage I had written, joy makes happiness look dumb. (laughs) Real profound statement, right? I was not an A student all the way through college. But I laughed out loud and goes, that's right. Joy, true joy in this life, it makes happiness look dumb. The world tells us to have comfort, to have happiness. It's all about your happiness and how you feel. Listen, when I have joy in Christ, when I'm connected to Christ, when my circumstances are less than desired, then I will have joy as I stay connected to him. And it will show in my life that even if everything's crumbling around me, I got joy. I got joy. It's not about happiness. It's about joy. Joy found by abiding in the vine. So if the goal of abiding is to bring the Father glory, then we have to understand how do we get there. This is the next fill in the blank. The path of abiding is connection to God and obedience to his commands. The pathway to abiding in the Father is connection, which is what abiding is getting at. But it's also following his commands. Verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, I want you to notice something here. There are two parallels in this passage. A passage, or excuse me, a parallel between Christ and the Father and a parallel between us and Christ. The parallel between Christ and the Father is that he's saying, I abide in the Father. I'm in the Father's love. The Father's love is in me, and I am in it. And also, I obey the Father's command. Whatever he wants me to do, I do that in order to glorify him. Abide and obey for Christ to the Father. The parallel track is we are called to abide and obey to Christ. In the same way that Christ abides in the love of the Father and obeys his commands, so also, my friends, we are called to remain, to continue, to make our home in the love of God and then to obey his commands. I think of it this way. We're called to kick back, right? Kick back, make yourself at home. Relax in the love of God but also to kick in, kick in with effort. I kick back knowing that I have his love and I'm abiding in his love and he has loved me with an undeserved, unrelenting love and I kick back in that love. I find security in that love but I also kick in with effort because I realize how much I have been loved. When we are inhaling the deep love of God, we will exhale the love of Christ to the world. And this breathing back and forth, I breathe in the love of God, I breathe out in obedience and love for others, this breathing back and forth is the very breath pattern of every disciple who claims Christ as their Lord. And as we breathe in the love of God and exhale his love towards other people, we are growing. Growth is the goal here. By abiding in love and living in obedience, growth will come in our life. Thank you, Lisa. If you were to come to our house, in our kitchen, we have a board that hangs right in the center of our home. The kitchen is right in the middle, and this board hangs. And this is a board where we track our different kids' growth. And you can see we got markers all the way along here of how they're growing. We have Molly's marker as well. 
She's not growing. And we have my marker here. I'm not growing, so those are kind of stained. But these, these continue to add in. And you can even see that they have taken it upon themselves at times to make their own marks because they are so excited about their growth. And we as parents are excited about their growth. There are times I get all sentimental and I'm like, oh, you're getting so big. Man. You know, I try to conceal the tears. I take photos of everything. Our pediatrician charts how our kids are growing, make sure that they're progressing. Our school that our kids go to, they pride themselves on showing the growth of the students year over year. As we raise kids, we expect them to grow. And when they stop growing, we have a concern. But when it comes to our Christian faith, for some reason, we don't expect growth as much as we should. The Father is expecting growth, continual growth in our likeness in Christ. He expects it and looks for it. When he's talking about bearing fruit, it's this idea of growth, and yet we grow complacent towards our own growth. Yet Christ is not complacent. He, there is nothing arbitrary about his expectation. He's saying, you, as a believer, must bear much fruit. You will. You will grow. And as you grow, you will bring my Father glory. You will live for the greatest purpose, which is to glorify Christ and, and all that he's done. Ephesians 2, chapter 10, or verse 10 comes to mind, this idea that I live my life growing so that my fruit will glorify the Father. We're ever increasing in our obedience to Christ so that there is growth in our life. And in fact, friends, the Bible tells us that if we have people around us that we don't see them growing or bearing fruit, that we are to stir one another up in love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, verse 24, that we should go into a room full of other Christians that are professing Christ. And if we're not seeing fruit in their life, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a small group, whatever it is, we say, guys, we got to stir the pot here. We're supposed to be growing. God expects for there to be growth. I put this in your bulletin, that to love Christ is to obey him, and to obey Christ is to love him. As I love Christ, I obey him. It's part of my growth cycle. And as I obey Christ, I love him. My longing for him to be more like him, as I continue to live for him and obey him, I'm loving him. And when I want to love him more, I continue to bring my life into conformity with his commands to obey him. As I obey him, I love him. As I love him, I obey him. That's how it works. My love for him is a response out of what he has given to me so graciously. I said to a friend on Friday, I said, we have to understand that obedience is not a prerequisite to grace, but obedience is a response to grace. He has so deeply loved us. And so I obey him, and by obeying him, I love him, and then I fulfill the one thing I was made to do, and that is to glorify God in heaven. This passage is as much about obedience as it is about love. I see this idea of love very clearly in this passage, and love is something in many other languages described by many different words. In our language, when we use the word love in English, it often falls short. We have one word in English to represent a multitude of meanings. Love. I can say, I love cupcakes. And I love Molly. Hopefully, those are two different kinds of love, right? I also love when Molly brings me cupcakes, OK? See this? I have one word to explain different types of love. But in the Greek and in the Hebrew and in other language, there's often, there's often different words to describe different kinds of love. And the love here that is mentioned in this passage is a love that does not expect back. This is a love here which we see founded in Christ. It's not a love to gain something from the person that is loved. That's how culture tells us to love. Love so that you can get something back. But the love of Christ, my friends, the love of Christ 
that he has for us and the love that he commands us to have towards others is entirely different in quality. This love looks out for the other's good. The Father loves Christ to glorify Christ. Christ loves the Father to glorify him. They constantly are loving one another. God is love and has always been love. It's part of his very nature. And by the triune God in heaven, we know that he could exist and have love because there are three in one. And so even before there was anything else to express love, so they loved one another. And then he speaks creation into it existence. And we come on the scene and then we sin against him and then yet in his love, he loves us back. He finds a way to call us back. He gives us his son. This is a love of a different quality, a selfless love, a love that lives for another's good. It's the exact love we see in the beauty of the cross. And I tap into that love by having faith. And though he doesn't expect anything back from me to earn his love, it is still my honor to obey him. And I remain forever indebted to him because he has so deeply loved me. You see, my obedience to the Father is not out of obligation. It is just that it is my most natural response to what he has done for me. Our obedience is our willingness to walk in the way that Christ walked for the glory of the Father and for our own joy. That's the crazy part of it. As we walk in love, abide in love, and walk in obedience, we are given joy. The reward of abiding is the fullness of joy. The reward for us to stay connected to the vine is so that we may have love and the love of Christ and the joy of Christ and the peace of Christ and the presence of Christ in our daily lives. The daily exercise of obeying Christ is at times necessarily strenuous. Daniel Henderson, who preaches here often, says, the hard part about the Christian life is that it is so daily. (laughs) And he's right. But that's also the joy of it. The joy of it is that it is so daily that as I live in his love, as, as I obey him, he brings me a very special joy. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full just as the Father's own love for the Son is the very thing that sustained him to be obedient to the point of death, so also the love we receive from Christ is the very thing that will help us be obedient till our point of death. He gives us joy. In fact, I would say that he invites us into an unescapable invitation to delight in glorifying the Father The greatest thing Christ lived for was to glorify the Father. It was his joy to glorify the Father. And so he says, come, come, come with me. Come with me, abide in my love and obey my commands and you will share in the joy, the fullest of joy by obeying my Father. I love that. As we obey the Father, As we obey Christ, as we obey God's word, we are abiding and we're giving the king his rightful place in our life. You see, God wants the throne of your life. And so often your little desires crawl up on the throne and they sit there, mine too. And we let other things take over our life. And God's saying, listen, if you're gonna abide in me, let me be at the center, let me be seated on the throne. And as I'm on the throne of your life, you will have unexplainable joy. It doesn't mean you're going to have a happiness and all your circumstances are going to be great, but you'll have unexplainable joy because you are in me. 
In ancient times, I've heard it said that whenever the king returned to his castle, they would put a flag at the top of the castle to say that the king is in residence and the king is on his throne. So take that analogy for a moment and apply it to our own life. If Christ is in our life and he's seated on the throne, then the flag of joy should be waving vibrantly over the castle of our life. I put it this way. Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in his residence today. How sweet is it to think that our little castles on the landscape of God's kingdom could have the flag flying saying, listen, the king is at home. The king is here. The king is on his throne. Let me ask you a question. If people look at your life, do they see joy from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and Christ on his throne in your life? Do they see it in your life? Or when they look at your life, do they see an angry, agitated, obsessed with his own desires kind of person? If you're abiding in Christ, then the joy of the Lord will be evident in your life. But if you're not abiding, there's going to be a lack of joy. You will be angry, agitated, always on edge because you're not getting your way. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 3 talks about God's glory in us or being glorified through us. And if you look at that Hebrew word, it actually can be translated to letting his beauty be shown in us. So I ask you, is the beauty of God evident in your life? Are people seeing that the king is in residence and he's seated on his throne? Friends, may we all be able to say, it is my joy to stay in him. And it is his delight to display his glory in me. May that be something we all can say. It's my joy to stay. It's my joy to obey. And as I do, he is glorified in my life. John Piper said it so well in his most famous statement. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Perhaps part of the reason you're lacking joy is because you're not abiding, you're not staying, maybe not obeying in the way that you should be. When you understand, oh, how deeply you have been loved, I believe it will compel you to come back and say, this is my king. This is my king. May he have the throne in my life. One last story. I heard a, about a teenage girl who was overtaken with emotion. One day as she was shopping with her mom, her mom was buying her some clothes and her mom went to pay and as she went to pay the clerk, the clerk literally gasped (gasps) and pulled back because the mom's hands were all disfigured, the arms were all disfigured, fingers were even missing and, and the girl was so embarrassed that she just ran right out of the store. She ran out of the store, ran all the way to the car, got in the car, slammed herself in. It was a quiet car ride all the way home. They got home. The daughter ran up to her room, slammed the door. The mom gave her about an hour by herself before she finally went in to tell her a story she had never told her before. She said, honey, I want to explain to you why my hands look the way they do. She said, when you were a baby, our house caught on fire. And I was in such a place that I could have easily gotten straight out the front door and nothing would have happened to me. But I knew you were in the back room and I knew the house was on fire and I would have rather died with you than to have you die alone. So I ran back through the burning house, the falling planks, to grab you out of your crib, to hold you tightly in my arms, then to dare to get us both back out of the house. And as I finally got back out of the house and collapsed onto the lawn in absolute agony, I moved your face down away from me and I realized you were absolutely okay. I may be forever disfigured, but I have you. At that moment, the teenage daughter came close to her mom. She started weeping 
and then grabbed the mom's arms and just started kissing all over her wounds because she realized in that moment how deeply she had been loved. Her mom's marred hands told her a story of how deeply she had been loved. Friends, the pierced hands of our Savior, Jesus Christ, tell us how deeply we have been loved. And when we grasp how much we have been loved, it will drive us to love Christ in return. It is my joy to stay in him. And it is his delight to display his glory in me. Abide in him. Bring him glory. Live for him.